afternoon from College Park. It's Wayne Viner and permanent guest Dave Preston. Happy to be here. Hey, Got upgraded uh, from also starring to special guest star like Luke Perry. Or <laughs> well, that didn't work out for him. Heather long Locklear, long. yeah. We're going to say Heather Locklear on Melrose. She was the special yeah. guest star for like eight and a half seasons. Right. Even though she was basically a regular. Right. That and, Amanda. And even though they say you, you have a face for radio, I think they're wrong. Okay. I've, I've also been told that I have a voice for print, but that's... Uh, yeah, I had the voice for news. Okay. Right, right, right. So, uh, Maryland almost, almost last week was actually in the game at the end. It, they, they had a chance. They've actually been in the last two games that yeah. we've seen. Uh, they they played well at Michigan State. The score, I think, 40-21 to 21 isn't necessarily indicative of, of how, of the, the margin of victory. Maryland just self-destructed inside the red zone again, uh, just like they did against Penn State, where they made too many mistakes, had too many penalties. And a team like Penn State two weeks ago, a team like Michigan State this past Saturday, they will take advantage when you make a mistake. The window of opportunity for Maryland to win in the Big Ten East, they don't have to play perfect, but they have to play very well. They can't beat themselves. And they're getting pretty good at that. Between <laughs> the penalties and some inopportune turnovers. Um, but they're better. Right. They're better. They're not losing 59 to nothing or 50 to three. They're in these games. And if you're gonna progress, from a team that's blown, getting blown out to a team that's going to win, somewhere along the road you have to start playing better, and I think Maryland is finally starting to play better. And I think also you see the scores. I think you look at the scores, oh, 40-21, to 21, they lost to Michigan State, 31-14 uh, against Penn State. Those games, the, the scores now aren't what they were 25, 30 years ago because teams are running a ton more plays. Mm -hmm. You're going to generate more points from more plays as opposed to maybe 20 years ago you saw each team run or each team run maybe 40 plays apiece. Now teams are running 55 to 60 plays apiece sometimes, mm -hmm. so you're going to have more points. I, I think the and when you run more plays, it's to the it's to the lack of it's to the benefit of the better team, the stronger team, because they have more opportunities right. to work off your deficiencies, sure. and that's what happened this past Saturday with Michigan State. They just were able to make a couple more plays here and there, and Maryland wasn't able to take advantage of some great opportunities. Uh -huh. So, Colby McDonald to me looked really good, especially on the short mm -hmm. yardage. Penny Boone early looked really good. The defense stopped Michigan State's running enough got toasted in the passing game again. So if out of those four things, if you just fix the big play right. part, maybe you win a game. It's like whack-a-mole. You're like, okay, we took care of the run. Oh no, the pass game. Oh no, we stopped that. Oh, we do that. And before you know it, you you're out a couple quarters. Or do they do they do quarters now at arcades? I don't know. I, don't know. I used to. Yeah. I guess you did too. Yeah. Network solutions, managed IT, and technical support. Viner Forgates makes your company work. Solutions to protect your business from WatchGuard, including firewalls and endpoint protection. Protect your company and make your company work with solutions from Viner Forgates. Um, so Michigan, I actually think Big Mason one. thinks, and I think Maryland actually has a fighting chance, maybe a little bit better than 40 to 21. So you said Michigan likes to run the ball, or Loxley said, Michigan yes. likes to run the ball, maybe a little slower pace. In a slower paced game, Maryland doesn't have the turnovers. He could really be in this one. One of these games, Maryland's going to win the darn game. Here's what concerns me. Michigan ranks second in the league at running the football. They average over five yards a carry now. I guess, was it uh, Blake uh, Kroom is uh, out or is it? Is, He's out. It's, uh, and yes. Uh, Haskins Blake, is in. Blake, Blake, Blake Corrin okay. is, is out, but he averaged over six yards a pop. Uh, Hassan Haskins mm -hmm. is just as good and just yeah. as much of a threat. Maryland ranks 13th in the Big Ten at stopping the run. That's been an eyesore all season. I mean, well, they, they and defensively, better. I asked. Coach Loxley uh, during the presser, it, it feels like it, it, the team is on the right track, but they just, it, it, what gives you cause for confidence? Because you look at the numbers each week, it's 40 points here, 51 there, 60 plus there, and they're making a lot of plays, but they're, they're still missing way too many tackles. He said uh, Tuesday that they missed 18 tackles against Michigan State. You missed 10, that's tough. They can't afford to miss tackles this Saturday against Michigan, or the Wolverines will control the clock. And it might not be 40 to 21, but Michigan will dominate a game where Maryland is not making the first tackle 
count, meaning that the first line of defense is able to make the stop. Uh, we've seen a lot of times over the last couple of weeks where a defensive back, Nick Cross, will make seven or eight stops. While that's nice, it's not as awesome as having maybe a D lineman or a linebacker make those stops early and often. Oh, you'd like to see Ruben Hippolyte right. make the stops. Jennings played again, first time he's played uh, a major portion of the game since he hurt his knee early in the season. I think that was against West Virginia. Right. So, so that's good. I mean, the guys are coming back. I just, I guess I still have a little more hope than maybe I should, maybe is warranted. Right. Because I can see them barely getting closer and I think there might be a breakthrough. I There's also a chance this could be a trap game because Michigan does play Ohio State one week from Saturday. That's a team that uh, Jim Harbaugh has not been able to beat at all since he took over in Ann Arbor. And the old joke is you could go 10-2, and two, but if you lose in Lansing, if you lose in Columbus, you've had a, a, an absolutely horrible season. You could go 2-10, and 10, but if you beat the Spartans and the Buckeyes, you've had a successful season. I feel that Michigan... It, 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 I, I, this game feels like it's going to be a close one at the half, and the question is, can Maryland extend their play, their strong play, into the second half? They played Minnesota tough for a half. They played Michigan State fairly tough for a half. It, can they extend that into the third quarter? They played uh, Penn State. They, they were tied with Penn State at one point, if memory serves. Can they extend that into the third and the fourth quarter? Right now, I don't think the program has the numbers. This is where... Okay, you, you, you match up uh, offense and defense, 11 on 11, 22 on 22, but how about guy number 35, guy number 45, guy number 55? That's where Michigan has the edge. That's where these schools in the Big Ten East have the edge, and that's where I think maybe Maryland falls up short. I think to, uh, to, uh, Talia Tungavailoa is the great equalizer. If he doesn't make mistakes, he can put up a ton of yards. If he's able to get things going in the passing game, maybe they have – I think they have a chance – to win this game, I think they lose maybe by 10. Fair enough. I have brought up the four decent recruiting classes, five decent recruiting classes line for years. Right. That for years, Maryland had maybe 19 of 22. Now you've got maybe 22 of 22. Right. But there aren't 85 kids here who are at that level where there are at a Michigan or a Penn State. And this is where the injuries really hurt you. I think we've seen, and it's it's just it's just a nick here, a nick there, but it's it's because the depth is not there, it's as opposed to it's I'm not gonna call this team the Titanic, but it's it, it's opposed to if you if you have a wall and it, it it's the there there's there there's only one or two layers as opposed to three or four layers. And so when there's a tiny hole, it, when you've got the depth it doesn't take as much of a cost to the team. This year's Maryland team, they've got a lot of talent on both sides of the football, but as we've seen with the wide receiver core getting decimated, we've seen it just feels like the wrong guy at each level for, for the no defense point. has been taken out. If it's just one guy at one spot, you might be able to you know, you know, know, work around that, but it's just it just feels like the wrong guy at, at each level of the defense, the line, the linebacking core, and the secondary. Looking at who's graduating, and we, we could go through that, but I don't mm. want to bore anybody, a lot of the names that you're used to that you think can play well are going to be here next year. Yes. If there is not a big turnover, if the transfer portal doesn't siphon off a lot of talent, Maryland next year with Terrence Lewis coming in a linebacker, we really could have something here. I think it's reassuring, uh, just because you, when you try to build a program, this is this is the third year for Coach Loxley. Really, that first year they jumped into recruiting halfway through, so he's had, in effect, two complete classes. One which was kind of hijacked by COVID, and it's in any time there's a volatile situation, it's easier for the best recruits to go with what they know. They know Michigan, they know Ohio State, they know Penn State, Maryland. It's tougher to compete for those kids. It's, it's, it's easier for those kids in the DMV to look to go elsewhere to establish programs like Alabama, Clemson, Oklahoma, as opposed to staying at home because they didn't have a chance to come to campus. They, don't, they didn't have a chance to see the Jones Hill uh, field house, the, the, the team house. So I think this upcoming winter will be should be the recruiting class that puts this team over the top, but can the kids who are here right now play well enough over the next year for that recruiting class to really blossom? That's the big question. And that is, we'll be back after this commercial break uh, with a little whip around look at all the coaching vacancies that are out there. We love our clients and you'll see that if you trust us. 
at the Jack Rich Law Group, the big dogs from the small firm. Find us online at bigdogsmallfirm.com. Hey, we're still in College Park, but there's a lot of college coaches that are out of a job, <laughs> yeah. aren't there? And you feel bad about it on one level because these are guys who have hopes and dreams that all of a sudden things get sidelined. You look at a guy like Butch Davis who was coaching a Miami team 20 years ago, had them on the cusp of a national championship. Granted, he's made a lot of money, his family is set for life, but his legacy as a coach, his life, his dreams, he went from being a very successful college football coach who had a good pro background to being a failed coach for Cleveland, a coach who got a North Carolina on probation, to now a guy who wound up leaving FIU. So it's amazing how different guys go up and different guys go down. I, I, was it Pat Kennedy who went from oh, Florida boy. State, That's had an offer to succeed uh, Tark at UNLV, didn't take the job, went to DePaul, went to, I think, Montana maybe, and, and then wound up at Towson, Towson. and I think win, he went winless or very close to yeah. winless. So I think the one that really, the, the big one this week, just because everything is local, mm -hmm. Justin Fuente not working out in Virginia Tech. And here's a guy who won 10 games his first year succeeding Frank Beamer. They won nine games the second year. They won the Coastal Division his first year at the helm, but could never get the quarterback situation set. Recruiting never really worked. And then all of a sudden, when uh, you know, when you had different you know, coaches come back, North Carolina all of a sudden is now recruiting in the Tidewater area, and uh, they they were a sub 500 team last year, and they have a chance to miss a bowl again this year. So how good? A couple of years after Beamer has mm. left the program, how good is the Virginia Tech job? I think it's a decent job. It, I don't think it's as good as Coach Beamer made it. As it has a chance to be a juggernaut because you're one you're playing in the coastal division and that means you're not playing florida state and clemson every season granted florida state and clemson aren't what they have been but there's a, when you look at brands it's easier to go against north carolina even though you know they're a little bit better now it's easier to go against uh the georgia techs and the dukes and even the virginias as opposed to facing the Seminoles and the Tigers every season with the chance of somebody else on that side being good. So I think I think it's I think it's a really good job. I don't think it's I don't think it's an elite ten win a season job that Frank Beamer had them in during their glory run from ninety nine to maybe twenty ten when they came into the ACC and they ripped off I think they won four of the first six coastal divisions when they were in the conference, which is just something that you don't do. You don't get back to that but you get to a point where you're competing annually for the conference championship. And I think it's a, I think it's a good job. I think you're going to see somebody from maybe a group of five school go for it. I don't know what Virginia Tech will do because Justin Fuente came from Memphis, group of five. Do you go for a high-level assistant? Do you go for a top coordinator? That's going to be their big question moving forward. Well, I'll take one of the national level and we'll wrap this up. Uh, Lincoln Riley starting to get a lot of buzz as maybe moving from Oklahoma to LSU. Is that a move? Who would make? I I would stay. I would stay with the Sooners just because people there. There's a certain amount of craziness at LSU because they've won so much over the years. They think that it's a birthright. And even though you have a great talent base, OU still has Texas at its disposal. Meaning they will go in there. And since the days of uh, Chuck Fairbanks back in the '60s, yeah. they well no. And one of the reasons why OU, uh, why Oklahoma always seemed to have a leg up at least early on. Uh, was they were integrated in Texas in the Southwest Conference was not until the late 60s, early 70s. And I think Oklahoma is always going to have a leg up on guys in Texas. And they, with Texas and Texas A&M in the SEC, LSU, they're able to continue to recruit down there. I'd stay at OU because it's a fantastic job. No matter how many championships LSU might win, Oklahoma is still that it, it's that creme de la creme. A school like LSU always wants to prove they belong in that at that level. OU always wants to stay at that level, and uh, it, it's it's like if you're at Oklahoma, you've got the secret key to the special room, and LSU you don't always have that. Uh, and I will, I cannot top that, so that'll do it, Dave, or Presto as he's known, Dave. D a v p r e s t o on Twitter. Follow us. Okay, and of course, no Bruce here today, but he will be back uh, after the George Mason game on Wednesday night. And of course, we'll be here for the Michigan football game on Saturday. Good afternoon from College Park.